What do you think about the golden bat uh, thing that Major League Baseball is discussing? I'm stuck on gamma rays right now. Those used to be in, like, the Batman uh, movies and cartoons and stuff, right? You Don't know? make me angry. You would like me when I'm angry. <laughs> uh, speaking of alpha emitters, uh, Eric Hausman <laughs> joins us on wow. the program right now. Uh, he's the House Majority Leader. Good morning, Eric. How are you? Good morning, gentlemen. Hey, I can add something to the radon because there's a school project that bids today that I'm worked up a bid for. Uh, Brookfield Elementary School down here in Fairfax County mm -hmm. and earlier in the week I had to take off three radon pits underneath of the concrete slab so there you go three three of them what did you have to do with them well uh, it's called a takeoff I had included in my bid it was basically ah. a four foot by four foot area that's underneath of the concrete slab I guess the structural engineer placed it in strategic locations and then there's a uh, PVC pipe. It looked like to be probably three or four inch that was in that pit. And I guess it would be uh, releasing any of the radon gas to the outside of the building. So there you go. See, you learned more about radon this morning than you knew. That's so right. those particles once out in space like that are not as dangerous as within the walls of a facility. Unless you shouldn't be running by as a jogger. No, no, it's, 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 it's about the concentration. Dilution's a solution to pollution. <laughs> So, so if, if you can get the, that radon out there and get more distance between the, the particles, then it's less of an issue. All of a sudden, he's Eminem over here. What was that? <laughs> well, I thought if you could say that five times fast, you know. I don't know where we got off track this morning, but we did early. Yeah. Uh, Eric, I looked at the uh, November numbers and What'd you think? it looked like a, a little surplus there. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So we'll go over the numbers real quick for your listeners. So personal income tax, uh, the collections were $151.6 million. We were $8.3 million above our estimates. The consumer sales tax, the actual collections were $170.8 million. We were up $5.4 million over estimates. Severance tax, severance tax was down a little bit. Our actual collections were $18.8 million. We had estimated $26 million, so we're down $7.7 .7 million. For the month of November and then our corporate net income tax we our actual collections were 15.5 million over our estimates uh, of 4.6 so, so we're up 10.9 and basically for the month of November we had estimated that we would bring in 381 million dollars in revenues we brought in 400 million so we're up 18.8 .8 million for the month of November so year year-to-date collections over estimates so far for five months coming in or five months in, we're up five million for the year. So about a million a month. About a million a month, yes. So any you can do anything you want with projections because, you know, that's that's what we think we're going to collect. But how yeah. do these numbers compare in terms of actual dollars collected to what were collected last year at this time? Well, for instance, like uh, personal income tax. Obviously, we were. Uh, I think we were probably about uh, a couple million higher. I know for, for the year-to-date performance for, uh, for the personal income tax, we're down about $25 million. That's a little less than 3%. I know severance tax is down, but, but just think about that. When you're trying to make these projections, and if you look at, if you ever get, if your listeners want to take a chance or take the time, look up Henry Hub, Henry Hub, and that's your, your spot natural gas prices. And you can see every month, how they've been running over historical average. Can you imagine trying to trying to estimate or project something that's uh, you know the price of gas is going up or down or the price of coal? Uh, gas right now I think is about three dollars and eight eighteen cents per million BTUs, and I think coal's right or selling right around on the average of one hundred and thirty six dollars a ton. So it's uh, very difficult to make these projections, but mm -hmm. just keep in mind they're just a projection. And I, I guess my point about the projection was, let's just take round numbers. If I'm projecting next month that I'm going to collect uh, $100 million, right, right, and I collect 101, I'm a million over projections. Right. But if I project low, right. well, next month I'm only going to collect $75 million, but I right. collect 101. Now I'm up $26 million on my projection. I'm feeling much better. Right. So the, I guess the question is, how realistic were the projections in the past and how much more accurate or realistic are they now, Eric? Well, so I'm trying to get a true take yeah, yeah. on whether whether 
we're cutting it too close, or we were just estimating so low in the past that it looked better than it was? Well, and I really can't answer that because I don't know what was in someone's thought process when they came out with those projections. But you could say that uh, that the revenue projections were lower um, because you were seeing a lot higher surpluses, but now they seem to be a little bit closer. Does the personal income tax cuts, does that have something to do with it? Probably. But you're, you're starting to see a, a lot closer, you know, revenue surplus of $5 million for the month or, or whatever, a million dollars a month. I think you're seeing a little bit more accurate, and that's what everybody had said that they would like to see. So now we're seeing it. So, yeah, Isn't this the better way to do it, Eric, than – well, I think people accuse the governor of artificially low projections for a long time to try to make these numbers look so much better. It is. It is. I mean, and then also to have a six-year projection, you know, where you could see your revenues that you're projecting, what expenses that, you're, uh, that you expect that you're going to see in the next six years, all those play into these projections. But uh, it's just like a monthly budget for your household. You're going to budget a certain amount of money. You're, you know what revenue you've got coming in. And keep in mind, we relatively have the same amount of revenue that comes in. For all the revenue that we collect from personal income tax to corporate net income tax to cigarette taxes, we collect about $5 billion to $5.2 billion every year. There was uh, some momentum, not necessarily in the legislature, to tie projections on income from the extraction industries as a way of covering PEIA costs. Yeah, bad idea. And many of you in the legislature said, no, these are way too volatile to try to cover PEIA, PEIA costs from. Right. And at the time, uh, not a lot of people bought that because the revenues coming from the extraction industries were so high. They were, yes. Are you grateful that more people <laughs> didn't go along with that idea oh, as time has gone by? Absolutely, because... You know, think back a year and a half ago, we were bringing in $800 million more, almost a billion dollars more in severance taxes, when generally we bring in around 300 to $400 million a year. And that's where we stay. You know, so absolutely, I'm so glad that, that, we, that the legislature didn't go down that path because it would have been very detrimental to us as of right now. Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, Good morning, John. In the, I don't know, a couple of years that I've been doing this here at WRNR, we've, there have been hundreds of millions of dollars, um, probably approaching a billion dollars of surpluses that have been, have been talked about. Where did that go? I mean, does it just go in a, the, the extra money, we, we got the rainy day fund, we got, you know, all this, but ultimately there's hundreds of millions of dollars that have to go someplace. Yes. What happens to it? So a lot of it went into one-time spend. Some of it went into highways and uh, maintenance for highways. Uh, also, we've we socked away 460 million of it into an income tax reserve fund. We also were putting money into our rainy day fund, and that's another thing. We have a surplus right now, in reality, of about 1.7 billion sitting on the sidelines. 460 million of that is is in a uh, personal income tax reserve fund. And the other $1.3 billion is sitting in a rainy day fund. But a lot of that money was spent for one-time spend. Some of it was base building. Whenever we do a pay raise, that is all base building. But most of that money was used uh, for one-time spends. At, at um, what point do we start spending the these cushions? We have There's a... A litany of people come through the studio. It often deals with um, with public employees one way or the other. We don't pay teachers enough. We have all these kinds of, of maintenance issues with schools and what have you. When do we start saying, okay, is it enough is enough. We don't need more in the savings account. We, we need to start spending these surpluses on, on fixing things like salaries for teachers or what have you. Well, that would be base building, and normally you wouldn't spend surpluses for that. Surpluses usually will take care of one-time spend, something if you if you have deferred maintenance costs at prisons or whatever. Uh, that's what you would spend your one-time, uh, your surpluses on. Uh, but for base building, I mean, I know everybody wants, you know, everybody, I guess everyone sitting there in that studio today would want more money, you know, higher salaries. They want their insurance 
cost of cover. I mean, you name it, but there there comes that fine line where you have to – you only have X amount of revenue coming in um, per year, and you've got to figure out what are the priorities of the state. You know, we went down this path before. Is it DHHR with foster care? Is it public education? The legislature and the governor needs to sit down and decide – what are the priorities for the next four years, and this is where we're going to spend the money. Is it for roads? Is it for secondary education? And those decisions sometimes are made, you know, during the 60-day session, but a lot of times they're not. And um, that's what I've, I've talked about for the last couple of years, that we do need to sit down and figure out what are the priorities of the legislature, and then we appropriate the money towards those priorities. Matt Miller. So as I hear the, the conversation there about those priorities, I'm thinking of conversations uh, right before the Thanksgiving break as we had a couple members of the school board in and hearing a bit of the show yesterday and a conversation with Sandy Hamilton on that uh, school building authority. Has money gone into that? Are we seeing uh, more money going into that school building authority to help meet the needs not only here in the eastern panhandle but around the state? Most of that money is coming from the lottery side. That's we have what we call a bucket list. In fact, uh, next time Hornby's in there, ask him to produce the bucket list. And that shows you the breakdown of all the little buckets where all the excess lottery and the lottery revenues go towards. And um, most of that money comes from lottery that goes all into the SBA and excess lottery. It goes into senior programs and so forth. So the legislature doesn't add any additional funds or any of the, say, excess funds? Is there, has there ever been a push to do that? Uh, no, we have added. Uh, last, uh, I think it was the session before, we did add, uh, I believe it was right around $25 million or $50 million, if my memory is correct. But we do add money to the school building authority. But where I was going with this, most of the money that is in your school building authority is all funded by lottery and excess lottery, hmm. not out of the general revenue account. Now, if there were surpluses, we could. We could do a one-time spend, depending on how many, um, um, you know, is there, is there deferred maintenance issues that we've got to take care of at higher ed or in prisons or state hospitals, or do we need more money into roads? I mean, those are decisions that the you know the executive branch is trying to make to decide how do I stretch those dollars to take care of these one-time spends. Take me back to the income tax reserve fund, and you talked as well, and then we've talked a lot about um, the rainy day fund in the state of West Virginia. What types of situations might arise for that money to actually be tapped into? Well, at any time, the rainy day fund can be tapped into because it's called a revenue shortfall fund. So if things were looking pretty dire throughout the year, the executive, the governor, would have a decision to make. Usually by six months in, the governor would make a decision, hey, do we want to have a mid-year cut? Do we want to have a uh, pulling money from the rainy day fund or what? whatever that instance should be? And uh, those would be reasons if you know, if uh, the economy were to go, you know, completely bad and, and we needed and we started seeing revenues only coming in of, uh, say, $100 million a month, well, then you may need to start propping up money from your rainy day fund in order to carry the necessary expenses that you have per month to carry on state government. So at $1.7 billion, you know, that may last you uh, five or six months. You know, considering that our, our if, you know, what I told you earlier, or generally what we bring in per year is five billion to five point two billion in revenue. So, you know, one point seven billion would maybe give you four to six months cushion to get you through those projections. So the executive branch makes that suggestion, hey, rather than cutting, let's maybe pull a little out of the rainy day fund. The the legislature as a whole then has to agree to that, yes, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. John, you wanted to ask a transition question. Yeah, I, I know you're part of the uh, governor's uh, governor elect, governor governor elect now. Governor elect. Um, his transition team. So, not to get ahead of any announcements here, unless you want to. Um, are you sensing any major changes in priorities between his incoming administration and uh, Governor Justice's outgoing administration? Yeah, I think you're going to see more of a hands-on approach with this governor, with Governor elect Morrissey. 
uh, you're going to see probably uh, – you've heard Patrick. I, I mean, I've heard him on your radio station talk about you know, looking for efficiencies in state government. You know, he does want to con- uh, continue the personal income tax cuts. Um, and I think you're going to see a whole different uh, – you're going to see two different styles of uh, leadership with between Governor Justice and versus uh, Patrick Morrissey. And I think Patrick will be more hands-on, and I think he's going to deliver quite well for us. How about on the staff level? Is Governor Justice stripping the state house of a lot of of institutional knowledge as he goes to Washington? I don't think so. I mean, I don't even know. I've, I've heard rumors that Brian Abraham is going with him, which is Brian's his current chief of staff. Uh, I don't know who else is going to Washington with him, but uh, there's always good people out there, um, and and that's a position or that's a job that. The new governor elect he's going to be doing to fill those those key personnel like his chief of staff his uh, chief counsel and then he's got to fill all the cabinet positions so i know patrick's working on that right now um i don't know any information of who he's picking for these spots but i'm i'm sure he's going to release that here within the next couple weeks and does he take office on january 1 I think it's January 13th is his inauguration. Okay. Yes. Does that make Craig Blair the de facto governor then? On January the 8th is Blair's last day. Um, so if the governor were to leave, the current governor, on January the 3rd, you could see you could see the instance where Craig could be the governor, the acting governor for the for five days. And on January the 8th, there would be a new Senate president elected, and then that Senate president could become the acting governor from January the 8th until January the 13th. Now, that's all hinging upon if the current governor, Jim Justice, decides to leave. Uh, but if he stays until up until at least January 13th, then you wouldn't see any acting governors. I read that the governor wants to continue coaching high school basketball while being a senator. Is that possible, Eric? I don't know. It's, it seems highly uh <laughs> impossible i mean you know most of the legislative session i know at the capitol is from january through march except for this time around it's going to be february march and april so i'm sure congress is in session during those times so it's going to be very difficult i think especially since they took his helicopter right because he used to be able to take it from his his home to games and back and forth and so you know that was how he could go from the capitol to other parts of the state and Elsewhere to coach his team and then get back a lot more quickly, so it makes yeah, it a challenge. It's going to be difficult, I would yeah. think. Hey, a couple of questions because you were the finance. <coughs> excuse me, you were the finance chairman. A few people know the numbers better than you uh, in the house. You have the third grade success act, the commitment to putting a teacher, additional teachers in the classroom there, right. the, the expansion of the Hope Scholarship Program as well, right, and uh, the uh, the natural. Uh, growth in expenses that comes with inflation in state spending. Are you concerned at all about the revenues meeting the bills, Eric, with some of those things that will be rolled out? Maybe here in three months I might be if the revenue projections don't pick up a little bit better. But, uh, I mean, keep in mind, even with the Third Great Success Act or any of these bills that have already passed, at any time the legislature can come back in and pause any program, pause any bill. Uh, you can make the, the uh, Third Great Success Act a pilot program for two or three counties. If, we, if we're starting to see where these costs are going to be greater and we're not seeing the revenue, then obviously some direction has to be changed. And, uh, but, yeah, it's, it doesn't concern me right now, uh, but we'll see here in the next three months. Is there an income tax cut that kicks in this January? Yes, 6%. Six percent will kick in this January. Yes. All right, Matt, you were about to ask. I was just going to ask: Are we expecting some of those revenues, though, to increase with the announcements that we've had over the last several years of large corporations that are moving into West Virginia? How long will it take for that element to to begin to filter into the system? Yeah, my projection is probably about a year, year and a half. Because keep in mind, you know, I've said this before on this station: we're, we're testing economic theory. Economic theory says if you want more of something, you tax less of it. But it does take a little bit of time in order to, to see those results. But uh, I would say within the next year, I, I think we're going to be very stable for 2025. 
Uh, obviously, the budget's going to have to remain re- re- relatively flat. We may, the legislature may have to make some key decisions as far as some uh, cuts. Uh, but I think you're going to see overall a stable 25. And uh, but a lot of these decisions we may be talking differently here in 2026. So. A lot of the candidates, particularly from here in the Eastern Panhandle, were they're all about eliminating the state income tax. Just cut it, get rid of it completely. Is is that even reasonable? It's reasonable if you're going to control the rate of spending. I mean, you can't go in there and keep continuing <clears throat> passing programs or continuing the welfare state to to the level where you know you have to then decide, hey, we've got to do something differently. We can't have, we got to stop the personal income tax. But yeah, the key is is controlling your rate of spending. That's been the key all along. And if the legislature is willing to sit down and discuss what those priorities are, they can control that rate of spending. Eric, great to have you on with us this morning. I appreciate your time as always. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. Y'all have a great day. You take care. Yep. House Majority Leader Eric Householder.